Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. I've lived my entire life as far north as 93rd Street and as far south as 67th Street, all on the west side of Manhattan. It was an adventure for me to go to Queens. So when I meet a person who moved here from India, I can only marvel at their achievement and wonder how they did it. Kala Ganesh came to this country in 1989, and I hope she'll tell us what it was like and what she's doing now. What was it like? <laughs> was it terrifying? Um, actually, I came here as a student, so I was kind of very eager to come here. And I had a very unusual upbringing in that I grew up in central India in almost a forest area. The primer with snakes oh. and leopards and all that kind of thing surrounding me. So it me. was really rural. Very, it was more than rural. I think then yeah, we had one very small village close to where I lived, and um, nothing for the next you know thirty miles. So was it a farm? It was not a farm. My father worked in the uh, the explosives industry in India. Basically, made explosives for the army. So they always located these factories in the heart of India, so that mm -hmm. enemy fire couldn't get to them. But also, it was all these remote areas. So, you know, it was in a valley. The factory was on one side and the housing was on the other side so that in case there was an accident, nobody would get hurt. So I grew, grew up and I kind of socialized myself through reading. I read every book that was available in the club library. And so I think I had somewhat of an unusual upbringing. I didn't wear the kind of clothes that young Indian women wore and didn't have the cultural context. I was just wild, basically. Climbed How many people and, lived there? How many people worked in the factory? Um, at that time, probably a thousand. So it was think, really it a started, factory town. Yeah, they just started it. Actually, they built the housing. We were the first people to move into the housing. We lived before that in a castle, an actual real old castle. And 75 families were relocated into this castle. All of us had a room and a bathroom. There was no running water or electricity. There were chandeliers. And we <laughs> lived in that. There were turrets and dungeons and you know monkeys Wonderful everywhere. Wonderful for imagination. It was great. It was really a magical childhood in that sense. But. So, you know, I had this Western framework way of thinking, so I was kind of excited, and I think I also had English, which is helpful. So I got off, and for the first, I think, month or so... Well, how did you even come here to school? How did you decide to... Well, you left there to go to college. I, I finished college. I left there to go. Actually, I moved from there to high, in high school to Deten High School in Calcutta. So I moved from a really, really, really low, sort of rural area to this very dense urban setting. And so who did you live with in Calcutta? With my parents. Oh, my father moved. moved. My father moved constantly, so we moved to this city. Did you have siblings? And one brother, older brother, who's about two years older than I am. And we had, uh, it was a very difficult adjustment going from there to here. And I also went to an all-girls school. So all of that was kind of hard adjustment. But um, in about two years, I totally fell in love with the city and its people and the language and all of that. And then from there, I moved to Bombay to go to college. So I moved all over yeah, India. So you're really. used to this. I'm used to moving. I mean, change I didn't has even go away positive. to college. <laughs> I went to high school on 135th Street, and I went to college at Barnard College at Columbia, so 116th Street. So I <laughs> never went away. Anyway, go and on. And then, so I applied for a PhD program here. Um, by that point, I had a two-year-old son. I was a single parent. And uh, pretty soon the magical thinking came to an end. You had been married, though. I'd been married and uh, divorced. And I came here, actually, and started college and realized very quickly I would have to put food on the table. Graduate school. Uh, yeah. No, oh, actually college. my PhD. Yeah, so grad. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I guess. Yeah. So um, after the first semester of PhD, I realized, OK, I can't do a full-time job and do a PhD program and attend to a two-year-old at home. So we'll have to put that on hold. I put that on hold and started looking for jobs. And that was a very interesting experience because I think culturally I had no idea that you dress in a particular way to go to interviews. Um, I came to the country with $500. Let me stop for a minute. Did, did you have a student visa? Uh-huh. And that wasn't hard to get? Not in those days. Let me Not even go back days. to India. Was your marriage an arranged marriage? Uh, no. Okay. Which actually left me with a lot of guilt because I thought, oh, maybe if I'd done what my parents had said, this would have They happened. wanted, they had somebody, they wanted you to They marry. didn't have somebody they had in mind, but they, yeah. you know, would have looked. Yeah. But I was always rebellious. Never yeah. did things the way they were supposed okay. to. <laughs> so, so then, um, so I started looking for a job, essentially. And um, I had, I came in with $500. I paid for, you know, a variety of things. And how and did you find an apartment? I was living with my brother, who has been oh. here for many years before. Oh. Um, so he, um, he and my sister-in-law were extraordinarily supportive, um, and remarkably so. And I started going on these interviews. 
I went to the nearest store and for ten dollars bought this hideous green dress <laughs> with a lace collar uh, that I've always kept. I think I'm not going to throw that away. Um, you know, never wore shoes in my life. We always wore open-toed sandals and slippers, so I had uh, that. And this was, I think, in January and February. <laughs> you can imagine me in this hideous green dress with the <laughs> sandals, no stockings. I go into these interviews, but I'm you know, so full of confidence. I have <laughs> the language. I ace the interviews, and I get all these four jobs and actually make a choice then. So I've always kept this dress because the more I got accustomed to the culture, the more difficult it got to me. Uh, it got for me to talk to people because then I was aware that you had to wear a suit or you had to dress a certain way, you had to present yourself in, you know, a particular manner. I had none of that, so I just walked into these interviews totally with my resume. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> well, it, it was interesting though to people. I mean, you were exotic, I guess. It, so your transition wasn't traumatic at all. It was traumatic in many ways, only because you lose your history and context. And I remember the first time awakening to that. Um, so I would come to get off at Grand Central Station and walk to Penn Station to go to Long Island to um, Adelphi. And I got off and I stepped out of Grand Central Station and for the first time realized that I understood what was happening around me, what people were saying, but nobody looked like me. And I rem distinctly remember that shock. I looked around and I realized, oh my God, yeah. I am actually in a foreign land and that just knowing the language is not enough. Um, so it was very frightening. I had to learn how to drive. I also was adjusting to being a single parent. It was just very hard. I had no money, and I had a great job before I left what, India, so I had made yeah. a lot of money. And this was so, you know, trying to manage in that manner. What was, what, so what job did you take, did you get? Um, I took the one at uh, NIANA, New York Association for New Americans, as a caseworker working with um, Jewish refugees from the Soviet Union. So did you have a rapport with them? It was very interesting because I think the HR person who interviewed me said, you know, you've barely been here a few months. Uh, you don't know anything about the Jews. You don't know anything about Russia. You don't know anything about New York. But she said, I really like you. I'm going to push your resume forward. If you can convince the program director, you're in. Isn't that a fascinating and I combination? Got in. It was. And then people came in and I realized, you know, India and Russia had had a very close relationship. Um, and. The Russians had seen all the movies, and they talked to me about movie stars from the old Indian movies, and sang, sang snatches of songs from those movies, and there was a real connection. And a lot of them would ask me if I was Indian Jewish. I wasn't, but never mattered, actually. Are I there Indian great, Jews? There are Indian Jews. Are many of them? No, most of them have made Aliyah. I think most of them have moved to Israel. But about three years ago when I went to India, I made a point to go to Cochin, where they have the last working synagogue still in place. And it was an amazing experience. My son was very keen. We went there. And when you entered, there was a board there that just said Jewtown. And so my son sort of just was shocked. I said, no, it's not, it doesn't have a negative connotation. It just means this is where the Jews live, yeah. or the synagogue. And we were walking past a few houses. And there was an elderly gentleman. And I said, actually, I'm pretty sure that he is Jewish. He came out and he said, are you here to see the synagogue? I said, yes, and he said, well, run along and see because they're going to close it at 12. But on your way back, if you want to talk to me, come by. I guess he was lonely, yeah. so we went. We saw the synagogue, which is spectacular. It's small, but it's beautiful. And on the way back, we stopped at his place. And he and his sister live there. And they said, look, all our children have immigrated to Israel. But for us, it's still a foreign land. We go there. We don't understand the language. And we just want to be home in India. Uh -huh. So they were there. And it was wonderful. But you always spoke English fluently? I always spoke English fluently. Did you speak as quickly as you do now? You know, it's a you problem. Have to I just, I think. Make it slow. <laughs> I think I do have to. And I, before I came here, actually, someone warned me about that. <laughs> God. It is, I always spoke English. But um, again, because of that, people assumed actually that I understood everything they were saying. Uh. And my first job was um, we were in Greenwich Village, the office was in Greenwich Village, and I had a roommate was sharing my office space. And one day when she came into my office, I said, so Renee, what is this about the village, the village? Everybody always talks about this place. What is it about this place? And she said, well, it's just kind of a cool place to hang out in. And then she went and I thought, geez, I didn't understand a word of that sentence. Okay. Thinking about it and I thought, should I ask her? No. Decided I might as well. I said, so Renee, what did you say to me right now? <laughs> I didn't understand a word of what you said. And she said, why not? I just said, it's a cool place to hang out in. I said, look, for me, coolness has to do with temperature, heat and coolness. And hang out, the only thing you hang out is the wash. <laughs> so I have no clue what you just <laughs> said to me. And I remember oftentimes things like that, that would happen. All those idioms and... Idioms smart. and also cultural references. Yeah. You know, politics.
right? Um, I had no idea. Um, so, but you were very, you were very confident. So you had you, a great feeling of power. So it wasn't that kind of a. I was. I think I was very confident in my work. Outside of that, I think it yeah. was very difficult. Right. Um, you know, I missed dressing a particular way. I missed really not having a lot of family around. I was very used to that. Um, and I, I know I didn't, I didn't have any friends at all, and I was a very, very gregarious person, so I had a lot of friends. I didn't have a single person, and I was just going to work and coming back. Mm -hmm. And it, it was just very difficult. I had to learn everything from how do you open an account in a bank here to what certain phrases mean. It, it, it was hard. It was very hard. Do you have a special empathy for people who come from other countries here? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, every, I think every immigrant's narrative is very special because it's so informed by context and culture and right. politics and history and class and all of that. Um, but I absolutely do because I think we share a sense of loss. Uh, we totally share many, many heartbreaking stories, I think. So it, it is. And have you, do you have a lot of friends from a community that shares your heritage? Or do you feel you've lost? that or? I've definitely lost that. I feel I lost that. Some of it of my own doing, I think, and mm -hmm. some of it, I think, just because of where I was and yeah. how it happened. And, you know, when you're an immigrant, you certainly lose status. You know, I took a much lower paying job, a much more basic job, because I wanted to be home at five to be with my you child. You were a social worker when you came here. I was a social worker. But, but you were also, what were you doing in India before you came? I was working with actually um, a group, an organization that had just, was made up of a group of consultants. And we were kind of in between the big funders like Oxfam and uh, the United Nations and the smaller community-based projects in India, all over India. So we were sort of in between. So they relied on us to actually monitor those programs, help them write when the grants, them implement them. Did it work both ways? It did. Yeah. It did. So it was a job where I traveled a lot, um, but then it was a phenomenal job because every project was different from every other project, and it was really a well-paid so job. So did you come here because of the divorce, basically? Um, I came here kind of to get a divorce and to go uh, to school both. Yeah. It was an opportunity for me to yeah. go to and school. And th so did the Russians speak English? No, <laughs> I had to work with interpreters. Oh, that's so interesting. But there's something about Russian because I think they all have, you know, the Indo-Germanic language. I think there's yeah. Sanskrit origin. So very quickly I was able to understand a lot of what they were saying, mostly because we repeated a lot of the phrases, you know, yeah. the benefit access, life in the United States and New York in particular. So I started very quickly to understand. And I really understood their sense of loss and the puzzling, you know, nature of things around them, the struggle to have children who are, you know, facing uh, a lot of So when did you become a citizen? I became a citizen the year before last, October. So were you, when, what happened when your student visa expired? Well, at that time, because I had a job, they were applied for me to get a work visa. I see. And a green card. They sponsored me for a green card as well. So you never were without a green card, or you were never here not legally? No. No. What do you think about our current debate on immigration? Well, <laughs> I'm fully, I support immigration, so, you know, having gone through that, right. and I think they're very, very um, hardworking, contributing members of society. I think most of them actually pay taxes. They contribute right, they in huge yeah. ways. And I don't think we can undermine what diversity does. Mm. for any environment in the country, and I think people just aren't talking about that. So do you think the United States, in a way, is the, the, the community is more enriched than it is in India because there's, there are more different kinds of people? I, I mean, the, I think the pluses and minuses, it's very enriched because absolutely everybody's experience is valid, and I think, um, but it depends on the individual whether we make use of that diversity, yeah. because there are people who live in bubbles their whole life and don't want to look at this. Um, and uh, have, you know, a sense of that the other person is an enemy and there are people who, you know, do rejoice in this and become part of this experience. So I met you, and I think we should let everybody know, uh, because I chair the board of an organization, Connect, and that board has recently um, appointed you to be director of Connect, the Thank executive you. director. Uh, and I met you when you were at Connect. But how That's did you right. get in Connect as a family violence prevention program. It's actually a program for peace. I like to take it further along than just domestic violence or family violence. It's really a program to show that people can live in a community with them, each other in a peaceful way. But how did you get to the question of violence in the family? Well, I have done, first of all, all my life I've worked on women's issues. Uh, and then when I was at... Um, was India conducive to being a feminist? Or was it the rural upbringing that you had? 
Um, I think freedom. it was just me. Yeah. Part of it was and me and where I was educated and my family. My grandfather was a Gandhian, very much a Gandhian, and really pushed for reforms on women. Mm -hmm. And so he was. So I was sort of very raised with that liberal ideology in my home. So and I was encouraged actually to mm -hmm. do all the things I wanted to do: travel and yeah. work and all of that. Um, while I was working at Nyana, I had just gotten my green card, and I was thinking, okay, I really need to move on and do something else. And I was thinking about it when they got a grant from the Human Resources Administration of the city to start a domestic violence program. And they actually recruited me and said, okay, would you like to do this? So that's how I started a program here. And that was that. for immigrant people? That was specifically, actually it kind of evolved into that. I always wanted it to be for immigrants and also because the organization itself was really working with immigrants and refugees. Mm -hmm. So it became ultimately uh, one of the largest programs in the city that worked predominantly with undocumented battered women so and children both. Mm -hmm. So it was a really uh, amazing uh, few years for me working with women from about 109 different countries at that point and just really enriched my... Um, it's an interesting aspect, isn't it, of the whole question of violence and domestic violence with immigrant women and American women because it would seem to me some immigrant women don't even realize that that's not something that should happen. They don't define it that way, but I think all women, when they uh, experience violence, experience pain. So in that sense, I think everybody knows something is wrong. They know yeah. what's happening to them is wrong. They may not have the options that other people have. They may not have ways in which they can deal with it uh, to make it stop, but I think everybody experiences it. I think you're right, actually. Sorrow. Although, you know, I did a lot of work with women, or some work with women who were in prison for having right. killed a batterer. Right. And I remember some of the women saying, that they thought that was just part of life, that they had seen the father battering the mother, and when their husband started, that was what they thought marriage was all about. Absolutely. Um, but most of the cases we got there were women who had already somehow been identified by the system. So a neighbor oh. had called or someone had you know, said something uh, about it, and it had already come out, or they had reached out to some uh, organization in the neighborhood. So, you know, at that point, but what many of them didn't know was that they could actually apply, um, you know, under the Violence Against Women Act to self-petition. They could get a green card without their spouse sponsoring them. And most cases, the men were really holding that over their heads. Yeah, I was going to say, that is a, that's issue. a major issue, isn't it's it? It's a With, very, yeah, very big issue. Because they're afraid otherwise if they, if they separate Absolutely. or report them. Absolutely. And this was pre-9-11, so yeah. a lot of, you know, at that point we were confidently able to say to the women that, you know, I don't think they're really going to come to an individual home if your husband calls them and says, you know, my yeah. wife's undocumented. And it used to be that a, the spouse couldn't report a, a spouse. So. Uh -huh. so it was very different. The climate was very different then. Um, we can't say the same things to women now. But it was amazing how many what, of them... What happens now? 9-11, well, you mean if somebody was undocumented, you'd be afraid to let the authorities... Absolutely, know. and they could be deported. Either the, you know, the woman could be deported, the victim, or the, you know, the perpetrator could be deported. And so there's a lot of now hidden domestic violence. Nobody wants to come. And a lot of the women really just want the violence to stop. They don't necessarily want their partners to be deported. They just want the violence to stop. You know, they've had a couple of children together. Often, uh, he may be the only breadwinner in the family. You know, and where is she going to go? Right. Um, lots of times, they don't have skills that are transferable. They don't have you know, language capacity. So it's a very difficult situation, and I think people have to look at it in that real way. That also recently, I mean, what, you, what the work connect, connect does is not the shelter type of work. It right. really goes in what, to raise awareness? And to raise awareness. We also work very deeply in communities um, because we feel, you know, unless solutions are organic to the community themselves, that they come out of people's concerns, people's understanding of their context and culture, they're not going to be viable solutions. I can come in from the outside and say, I think you should do this, this, and this. It's not going to make any sense for that com community. So I think communities have to come out with solutions. So using that as a premise, we're really working with organizations that already exist in the community, not necessarily those who are providing domestic mm -hmm. violence services. These could be um, Head Start programs. These could be nurses who are going to people's homes. These could be women who are running laundromats. These could be street vendors. Um, and it could be someone, you know, any range of services that you can think of who can see that someone is struggling with violence, knows how to ask the question, and also is aware of what's happening in the neighborhood, what's available, what resources are out there, and can understand safety 
while giving this information to You train to these people from, from all these organizations. You run a training institute. We run a training institute, and um, we train all these people, but we also... How to identify and then how to respond. How to respond. But additionally, what we do is we actually just engage them in conversation. So we say, okay, are you interested in this issue? Do you see it? And most often they, they know that... The, uh, if they are doing substance abuse, providing substance abuse services, they know the problem exists, but they've never asked the right questions. Right. So because they say we, we could ask the question, but we don't know what to do next. Mm -hmm. So we engage them in conversation. If you were able to do something, what would it look like? What's the best way in which you can respond to this? And everybody has a different way. And we essentially facilitate this development of this idea. They come up with the idea and we help them set that's it up. Very, yes. So that's how we engage all yeah. the dis different groups. There's been a lot of discussion lately about trafficking of women. Mm -hmm. What does that really mean? Well, it's, uh, you know, it really means people who are brought in this country and used illegally to make money off of the sex trade or as Are uh, they brought in workers. legally or illegally? Well, they could be both. Both. They could come in with a tourist visa or they could just be, you know, here And it's mostly person. not Americans. That's very As you mean the victims of yeah. trafficking? Yes, they are from all different countries, and and it's really a f happening. It's happening a lot. As a matter of fact, uh, recently and on my way here, that's why I, got, I was yeah. a little bit late coming in, is you know we've been noticing these young women with children in strollers, and I first saw one uh, young woman, and when I talked to someone who worked nearby, she said, you know, they've been around here for about a year. It's not just her. There's another person around the corner. And then when I brought it back to work and I said, you know, I saw these two young women, someone said, wait a minute, but there's one uh, near in Penn Station that I see. And it seemed like they all fit the same profile. These young women, they were not native-born American women, and they had young children in strollers. And one uh, of um, our staff people at Connects, then when he approached her to ask her if everything was okay, there was a guy who came by and they made eye contact and she moved away from him. And so I contacted some organizations in New York who are working with victims of trafficking, um, ECPAC, New York Asian Women's Center. So, who, who are they? A New York Asian Women's Center is doing uh -huh. that work. Safe Horizon is doing that work. ECPAT, I don't know what, what that stands for. ECPAT. E e uh -huh. And Nayana. And I said, what is the best way we can, do, uh, you know, help these women? Um, I mean, individual organizations, it's very difficult for them to go out there and do the surveillance. Right. So there is a conversation afoot about how best to help these women. Right. But it's very real. I can't see that. Right. And I think each of the communities here have a different way of operating. And this is a very hidden thing. But on the other hand, you know, community people uh, should know that this is happening. It's happening in our communities. And how to, you know, what are the hints that might be happening? What are the clues to look for? And also to understand that there are special provisions for people who have been trafficked in this country. It's so you amazing know? to me um, that this would happen. I mean, I just, um, how do, I don't understand how they get them the women into the country? Well, a lot of them actually are told they're coming here to work in nail salons or they're coming here as housekeepers or, you know, a variety of reasons. And are there and any then, countries that particularly get them? Well, I think they're uh, actually from everywhere, but probably um, a lot of East Asian countries, uh, a lot from the Balkans, um, they're from everywhere, you know, and at different times they're more or less from different countries. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm trying to see how much time I have left, and I can't see it, but now I can. Uh, so do you think that we are ever going to, where do you think we should start trying to eliminate? I mean, I think all of these are all part of the same problem. Yeah, oh. I have a sister-in-law who, who works in a school. It's a special high school or program to get people to take GEDs. Mm -hmm who have been kicked out of school and aren't in school. It's run by St. John's University. And it is a very difficult task. You know, these are 17, 18, 19, 20, 22 year olds mm -hmm. coming to school. I don't, I mean, so what if these kids get a GED? What's gonna happen to them? That's the part that bothers me. What's gonna happen to the families once we see the, the violence stop? But when are people, when are we gonna have to stop stopping it. How, what do we do to prevent it from the beginning? I think the only way is for people to start facing the issue of why there is violence against women, women and girls. Because so far I think we've really done a great job of really creating a service network and making sure that when women are in crisis and children are in crisis that we actually yeah. are able to provide them help. But you know we really have to start 
deal with a much more difficult question of why do people feel it's okay to beat up women? Why is female selective abortion okay? Why is it dowry that's still happening? The question of patriarchy and the question of power and control and who runs and creates these social norms and rules, I think it's something we have to look at and very early on uh, talk about the way we are raising our children. Yeah, the I boys think it and does start with the, very, with the babies. Very, 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 very young. And it's very interesting to us that as we talk to various service providers and community members, there is a lot of interest. People, there is always an aha moment. Yeah. You know, we're hoping that because our training is so different that it does really talk about social justice. It talks right. about violence against women as a social justice issue within the framework of race, class, gender, all of those things. That p it just transforms how people understand their experiences and, in life. And the other concept that I think is developing more and more around all different kinds of problems is that importance of community. And that you can't just talk to a family, you, that neighborhood and the community that people are living in, the combination of it all. And, you know, every time there is a horrific, uh, you know, murder, and every article you read, it always ends up with somebody in the neighborhood saying, well, they knew about it, they kind of heard things yeah, all the time, yeah. people walking by. So it doesn't just affect that one person. It affects the children who are left behind. It yes. affects the larger family. It affects your neighbors, your community. It really creates such pain in the community. And people are always saying, we didn't know what to do about it. As a matter of fact, Connect has started its first bystander campaign because we feel that we are all bystanders. We're often caught in situations where we see something and we're totally paralyzed. We don't know how to respond. So the bystander campaign is to tell people, people what to do when they see it. It's Violence. basically to encourage people to call us. Connect has a, has a uh, website. Has a website. It's www.connectnyc.org. So people should look people at that and they look can at the find website. the number and everything else. Well, Kala, I have to tell you that I'm very glad you came here from India. <laughs> Thank I you. I still admire the courage and the enormous change in one's life. I just can't imagine it. But then I'm about the most provincial person around. So <laughs> thank you very much and much thank good you, luck. Thank you, Ronnie, for having me. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv.